Before we start the session, uh, General Terras has a very brief announcement. Thank you. That's not that I don't want to leave the stage. I will run away. But I, as you have seen, some of our people here wearing uh, the badge, which is a flower. We, it took us a certain time to find out what is an English expression. This is liver, liver leaf is the name. Uh, this is the badge which supports Estonian veterans. We have introduced uh, Veterans Day 23rd of April last year. We have launched a campaign in support of veterans. Every of these badges costs two euros. The money will go uh, to support uh, uh, a center of prosthetics, which will uh, give them the possibility to deal with our civilians and soldiers who have lost their limbs. So if you would feel that way, to wear that badge during this uh, couple of days, uh, you can buy these uh, flowers uh, before the lunch and during the lunch. So I would appreciate that if you would support our veterans. They have done a marvelous job for NATO and for Estonia. Thank you. Thank you very much, General. My name is Mike Holtzell. I'm from uh, Johns Hopkins University in Washington. Our topic for this session is energy security. Is natural gas still a geopolitical tool in Europe? I think the word still is, of course, important because, as we all know, on several occasions, Russia has interrupted the flow of gas to Western Europe. And as we also know, Russia, through Gazprom, uses the pricing of gas contracts to exert political pressure. What's the situation today? Europe gets just under one quarter of its gas from Russia, and half of that passes through Ukraine. As people in this part of the world know, some countries get 100% of their gas from Russia. So the question is, can this vulnerability be significantly decreased? And if so, how quickly? To answer this fundamental question, I would urge our panelists to address the following topics, among others. Diversification of supply, storage capacity, interconnection within Europe, exploitation of shale gas, both in the United States and Europe, and the export facilities needed, energy efficiency, and last but not least, how the West can leverage the facts that oil and gas exports make up 70% of Russia's annual exports and fully 52% of its federal budget, and Russia's need for access to the world financial system in order to exercise its hydrocarbon influence. And I might say, even though the topic of this morning is natural gas, I, I think it's, it's only fair that we give the panelists the chance to broaden the discussion to include oil, nuclear, renewables, even coal. We're very fortunate this morning to have as panelists five renowned experts, whom I will brief, even though you have the audience here uh, in the hall, uh, has their bios, I'd like to briefly introduce them for the benefit of our international audience. I'll do it in alphabetical order. Peter Balash joined the European Commission in 2005 and is currently the Deputy Director General and the Directorate General for Trade. Earlier, he was the permanent representative of Hungary to the World Trade Organization. And before that, he held senior positions in Hungary's ministries of economy, and foreign affairs in Budapest. Václav Bartuška is a Czech diplomat, politician, and journalist who since 2006 has been the Czech Republic's ambassador at large for energy security. He worked as a reporter for the daily newspaper Mlada Fronta Dnes, and in 2010 he became a special government commissioner for the completion of the Temelin nuclear power plant. Matt Breise, whom all of you I think know already, has been the director here of the Center, International Center for Defense Studies since 2012. He was a career U.S. diplomat prior to that, 
His final posting was as U.S. Ambassador to Azerbaijan. He also served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs. He worked on the National Security Council as Director for European and Eurasian Affairs and had postings at, US, at the U.S. Embassies in Warsaw and in Moscow. Yaroslav Nevorovich is the Minister of Energy of the Republic of Lithuania. Before that, he acted as Chairman of the Management Board at the Lithuanian Polish Energy Interconnector Project, Litpol Link. From 2006 to 2008, he served as the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania, a post that he uh, succeeded before he had held earlier positions in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And finally, Alan Riley is professor of law at the City Law School of City University in London. He's had this position since 2005. He served as a research fellow at Nottingham Law School. He is also associate senior research fellow at the Institute for Statecraft, associate research fellow at the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels, and fellow at the British think tank Respublica. I'd like our, each of our panelists to give us a brief overview. I think we have permission from the authorities to uh, go a little bit beyond our time since the last panel exceeded its, its time, but we'll try to keep it under control. If each of you could perhaps speak for seven to eight minutes and then we'll have inter-panel discussion and turn it over to the audience. So, please. Okay, well, good morning all of you. <clears throat> Is natural gas still a geopolitical tool? Well, no, in most European countries, yes, in some. No, it is not, and it never was in countries like mine or Poland or I believe Lithuania, Estonia, and others. In countries which clearly know what they want and whose government was decide really decisive in getting it. Yes, we were blackmailed many times. There were cutoffs in oil and gas, there were difficulties, but you know. Just imagine that Václav Havel, the Czech president, would be approached by Russians in the 1990s, and they would say, hmm, we can offer you a discount on gas in exchange for a base in Czech Republic. Well, <laughs> I know what Václav Havel would say. I will not repeat it here because there are ladies in the audience. <laughs> I think the same would be heard from uh, Lech Walesa or Lenart Mery. We knew what he wanted. We were willing to sacrifice quite a lot. So yes, there were difficulties, there were cutoffs. We also had to do a lot of things. We built, in Czech case, we have built a pipeline for oil, which now brings more oil to the country than Družba pipeline does. We, had started, we started to buy Norwegian gas in 1997. So you have to do plenty of things. You have to build diversification, you have to build pipelines. But the main thing is you simply don't go with the guy who offers you candies and would like to take you to his cellar. I, I, I think it's basic logic. And if you go, well, consider the case of Ukraine, which definitely is a, is a country where natural gas is a geopolitical tool. Now, that has nothing to do with gas as such. It has everything to do with money and corruption. Until this moment, 23 years after independence, Ukraine has no meters of gas on the Russian-Ukrainian border. Zero. Which means that all the numbers we get about the flows through Ukraine are made up. The difference is in this amount of gas, which probably does not get to Ukraine, but it gets paid for by Ukraine, is somewhere around 20 billion cubic meters of gas per year. That's roughly $7 billion of gray money. Now, if we here around would be Ukrainian Verkhushka, <coughs> what interest would we have in having meters on the borders? Come on, I mean, they would just screw the country, as they do, and we would just hope to get it going on as for as long as we can. The fact that no meters on the Russian-Ukraine border were installed by four successive presidents, Kravchuk, Kuchma, Yushchenko, and Kovic, it's, it speaks a lot. In 2009, I had the privilege to work for the Czech presidency of the EU during the gas crisis. I had the pleasure to meet both President Putin, then the time Prime Minister Putin, and uh, others in, in, in Kiev. And I said directly to Mrs. Timoshenko, the Prime Minister of the time, and Yushchenko and others, that either you will build now, in 2009, the meters on the Russian-Ukraine border as it is, or one of the future governments in, in Kiev will build them on the left, or on the right bank of the River Dnieper, after losing the left bank. 
they, they laughed. I was in Kiev again a month ago, spoke with Mr. Prodan. I started our meeting with the same, this time not, not already a joke. We spoke just a few hours after President Putin spoke about Crimea and Kremlin. So there were no jokes, but I was assured by the new government that meters on the borders are still not their priority. Well, I understand. At the same time, I feel sorry for the country. And I fully understand why, why Putin said what he said in 2009. We had a long meeting, six hours, at the height of the crisis. And we spoke Russian, and at one moment I was really upset. And I said, well, you have all Ukrainian politicians in your, in your pocket, Karmania. And he said, well, you cannot buy Ukrainian politicians. I was surprised, and he continued, you can only rent them. Well, <laughs> Putin, I, I'm sure he hated Václav Havel. I'm sure he hated Wallens and many others, but he could never say that about our leaders. And I think Ukraine is now you know, <laughs> harvesting the fruits which have been ripening for a long, long time. And having no respect for Putin is basically a result of being part of this black deal, dark deal for so many years. So. That's basically all I can say. It will continue this way. It will probably increase the pressure or, and the usage of natural gas as a tool. Tool will increase in years to come because it's now one of the few tools which Russia still has. I think other speakers will speak about it more eloquently than I can because I'm probably too blunt for my job. <coughs> but what is definitely going to happen in the future is that you will see more and more cases when some countries in Europe will say, well, we had to do this deal. You know, it was, it was so economically viable and important. I will not speak about Hungary and the Paksh, even though I think it belongs here. But we will see more and more cases when Russia will try this deal, once again. You know, to offer the candies. If you want to go to the cellar, good luck. I think most of us don't. And final word on the geopolitics. You know, something has really changed with Ukraine. I remember in summer last year, we did a presentation on Capitol Hill, on Capitol, in Washington for the US Congress with Congressman Turner of Ohio and Anita Orban from Hungary. And it was a basically a half empty room, and not too many people came. We spoke about the LNG exports from the US, and we were basically seen as a lost case. I'm flying to Washington tomorrow for another meeting on Capitol Hill, which will probably be a little bit more populated, and the hall will, pro hall will be probably more full this time. So things have changed, definitely. What, is, has, what has to really change on our side is to understand that we are no longer in normal situation. Ukraine will not calm down. It will not go away. Ukraine will lose its left bank somehow. Maybe directly incorporated into Russia. Maybe a new republic will be created there. I don't know what, what Putin really wants. But the crisis will not go away. And the pressure will step up on us. And we have to do our homework, build pipelines which are necessary to build interconnectors, to really start thinking in emergency terms, not just normal terms. Business as usual ended in February. That's about it. Thank you. So Professor Riley, we just heard the <coughs> crucial importance of leadership don't be bullied, don't take the candy, stand up for the independence of your country. Do you think that we're in a position in Western Europe, let's say, or Eastern Europe today, where the leaders, if they want to, can stand up? I mean, are there, are there things that can be done in a relatively short time to start to wean us away from the Russian dependence? Um, <clears throat> let me start by answering that question by simply saying yes. And, and um, what I'm, going to, I'm going to deal with this in two parts. But let me start off with giving perhaps Ukraine a tip. If the gas pressure starts falling in your pipeline suddenly, that is probably an indication that invasion is imminent. At any one time, there's a large amount of gas going through the system, perhaps a billion dollars or so, or slightly more than a billion dollars, 
going through uh, the Ukrainian transit system. I imagine at one level Gazprom would not like to lose that as the T90s trundle across the territory of Ukraine. Um, and I'm, I, I also, there's obviously, you know, if, you, if they do blow them up, if you do start having fighting around them, uh, you will lose much more of the pipeline if there is gas in them, obviously with explosions and so forth. So one of the hints, one of the suggestions I've got for Ukraine to start with is, uh, is to keep an eye on the, on the pressure of the gas pipelines. That could be an early indication of, uh, 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 of invasion. And that is actually uh, an important lead into what I want to say about our supply security, because we, we have two levels of problems. We have an immediate problem, which is that the, Europe, the Ukrainian transit system provides about 15% of European gas supply. And if there's either a Russian actual physical invasion with armoured columns flying across the border, or there is a, a, a partisan war, uh, which is triggered by the R Russian destabilization measures in the East, we are looking at the loss in a very short period of time of a significant uh, amount of our, uh, our gas supply. And that, to my mind, is a, a, an immediate threat to European supply security, which has to be addressed. And uh, my argument here will be to start with is that we are not really any more in peacetime. We may not be in wartime, but we need to think about this in terms of emergency measures. And that may well include for Europe to think about some, ver some potentially unpalatable measures, which would include, for example, suspending the operation of the Large Combustion Plant Directive, bringing back online a, a, a number of our dirtier coal-fired power stations. Thankfully, there's lots of, because of uh, cheap shale gas in the US has displaced US coal, there's lots of cheap US coal available we can use to uh, replace <coughs> fairly quickly uh, supply. Uh, um, we, we can br bring that online. So that's, um, coal is one option. Um, we can look at the, another unpalatable option will be to, um, take steps to um, lower the statutory heating requirements for offices and factories across Europe. Um, we can, or, uh, again, this is for the Germ German government, look again at the nuclear power uh, closure programme uh, and temporarily suspend it. And it's, these are sort of the things that we may be actually having to do in a short period of time. What we should be doing now if we are not already doing it, is filling every last storage facility we have in Europe uh, to maximise the amount of storage available. Now, we do. We are lucky. We had a cold winter. We had a we had a mild winter. There's quite a lot of gas in storage, but we should be trying to fill that up as much as possible uh, for this uh, for this potential immediate supply security threat. It seems to me that's, that uh, I, 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 I don't, it may well be behind the scenes that a lot of this is going on, but it seems to me that that is uh, our, our immediate supply security issue. Now, our bigger problem is that we have now got um, <coughs> this, uh, a revanchist Russian state which, uh, which seeks to destabilise uh, uh, European security. And... Uh, we have, over the last 40 years, uh, taken up a significant degree of supply dependency on Russia, both in Western Europe, particularly with Germany, about 40% of German, German's, gas, <laughs> German's gas comes from, uh, Germany's gas comes from uh, Russia, and, and then for Central and Eastern Europe uh, and the Baltic states. So we have... The, the real difficulty here is, is, you know, the question is, is natural gas still a geopolitical tool in Europe? The question is, is now we have a revanchist Russia, is it anything but a geopolitical tool? And how do we respond to that? And I think there are uh, a number of options here. Uh, we can deal with this. Firstly, I mentioned coal uh, to start with. And uh, again, because of the uh, uh, ama huge amounts of liquid coal in the US market because of shale, we could simply build more coal-fired power stations. The Germans, are, I think, are, are building, uh, I think, eight gigawatts of new capacity. Uh, they could build 16. Uh, other states could simply build in more coal-fired power. Now, we could do that in a relatively short period of time. I'm talking, I'm, my hori time horizon here is simply five years. We could do that. That would not be um, 
too difficult for Europe to do. Now, the problem with it, of course, is, as you may have noticed, coal is rather dirty. And there is another option. And the other option is in relation to shale gas and to wind power. And I mentioned shale and wind because they both have the same problem. They're subject to very formidable permitting and planning restrictions. And the timescales for those are enormous. It makes it very difficult to develop a shale gas well. It's very difficult to get uh, a wind power plant up and running. Now, one of the issues for Europe is if you take the view that we are no longer in peacetime, we may not be in wartime, it is some form of emergency. Can we streamline those procedures to make it deployable quicker? Quadrilla, uh, the British shale gas company, said the other day that if, it was a, if they had emergency procedures in place, uh, we took it as a view of national security, they could start commercial production in a couple of years. Well, perhaps we should look at that sort of uh, approach in order to reduce our supply dependency. And I think that's one of the ways forward, I think, for all of this. The other element is actually completing the single market in gas. Because one of the great difficulties here is that Western Europe is in a much, much better position than Central and Eastern Europe and the Baltic states. Western Europe is much more interconnected, has much more supply diversity. Um, Whereas Central and Eastern Europe still, although we have made some progress, is still too disconnected, too disconnected from Western European supplies, from alternatives. And I think one of the difficulties with Prime Minister Tusk's approach of creating a kind of single buying organisation is that uh, we actually have two different markets in Europe. And as long as you're having that, that would be a very difficult thing to take forward. And I think actually the best approach is to promote the single market in gas and complete that in terms of both physical interconnectors, full compliance with the third energy package and the surveillance of the European Commission in antitrust terms. That would all help really significantly to uh, help protect our supply security. The other issue again is in terms of interconnectors is the willingness, and I think this is one point which Prime Minister Tusk was uh, very acute on is the willingness to actually for the European Union to be able to pay a significant proportion of the or uh, of any uh, new pipelines which uh, need to be uh, put into place in the uh, in the region. And again, there are issues here about permitting and planning and being able to do it more quickly and recognising we're not any more in peacetime. Now, the the other major point I want to make, uh, and I don't want to go on too long at this stage is to recognise that taking all of these steps and moving significantly to diversify away from Russia will result in a Russian response, especially from a more revanchist Russia. So there's going to be lots of things the Russians are going to do. You're going to see, I think, more candies being offered. So they'll try and peel away certain states. Um, some states, I suspect, will be offered the old terms of $50 per 1,000 cubic metres in various parts of Europe to try and pull them away. Um, I think you'll see more attempt at energy acquisitions. Um, all of these sort of uh, to, take, to try and take over, either directly or by, via um, uh, kind of shadow companies to take over various strategic energy assets. And we have to be able to deal with that sort of thing. And the other issue is to actually ensure also that the, as many member states as possible actually are on our side and actually the candidate member states as well. I mean, one of the things which worries me is if you look at the Western Balkans, you have a mixture of member states and non-member states. Uh, it's a really important energy security flank for Europe. There is the possibility of building uh, a southern cor corridor uh, access there. There's offshore oil and gas, and there is the uh, potential of an LNG terminal in Croatia and a reverse flow taking gas into Central and Eastern Europe and onto Ukraine. Now, at the moment, for example, in Croatia, you've got a serious issue with um, the local energy company, INA, uh, being subject to non-market, non-liberalised um, uh, regulations. Um, more, the state has recently created a, a consumer uh, wholesale monopolist uh, against all the liberalised rules, undermining the ability of investors to come in to that state. And that's 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 sort of that's one area we've got a problem. Another area we've got a problem is in Serbia, where a candidate member state is working with the Russians 
uh, to uh, put in place a part of South Stream and undermine uh, European supply security. Now, you've got to ask a question, should one of the conditions for um, a, a, a access to the European Union and accession conditions should include a, um, a condition which that you're not allowed as a, as a candidate member state to underply, undermine our supply security. So the, the quite, um, one of the issues for me is what institutions do we need to deal with this? What approaches? One of them seems to me is a, a EU-style committee on foreign investment uh, to actually review strategic investment uh, in, uh, um, in, in, from, from outside the EU. It seems to me that, that, that that's one way to actually reduce uh, some of the Russian um, influence in this. The other issue is uh, the application of, uh, or looking at the creation of a, a, an energy security office to be actually, to be able to focus on some of these problems and uh, create a series of measures, partly anti-corruption, partly transparency, to uh, make it much more difficult for the Russians to respond to this. And there are lots of other things that we can do uh, in the longer term. Uh, US shale is LNG, but I don't think that can reach us at scale much before 2020. There is um, the TANAP, the only thing which I think with a major external in, in infrastructure project which could make a bit of a difference is the TANAP TAP pipeline. I mean, one of the points about that is that uh, by about 2018, it brings about 10 billion cubic meters of new gas into Europe. And that's the largest amount of new gas coming into Europe from anywhere. One of the questions about that is that the pipeline is going to be built and we know that it's possible to increase the capacity with compressor stations. So can we get more gas from the Caspian, Turkmenistan, from northern Iraq? That might be something we can look at as well. But the trouble is with a lot of the projects that uh, talked about Eastern Mediterranean, for example, most of the, nothing's going to happen at scale much before 2020. So okay, that's kind of my overview. Is that... Super, I stop it? Stop super. It. Mr. Uh, L. I think we should fly. Tell, tell us a little bit about the uh, interconnector project between Poland and Lithuania for starters. Interconnectors are key, as we've heard from all our speakers. Yes, I will. Thank you very much. But first, let me congratulate uh, Matthew and all the organizers for this wonderful event, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Really, really honored. So if I answer first to the question of this panel, uh, is uh, gas a, a geopolitical tool? I, I guess that the, the farther you get to the West, the more business-oriented, as, as, uh, uh, as, as, as much as you can get business-oriented uh, uh, Russian gas companies uh, look alike. Uh, the further you get to the east, uh, the more other experience we have. So it makes us believe that uh, gas might not be that different from, um, from other uh, natural resources uh, where we have seen uh, them being used as a geopolitical tool or at least a tool for improvement of economic conditions for, for Russian companies when sometimes it's difficult to distinguish uh, between uh, two, two of those uh, areas. Uh, um, Gas, when we look at it in a global scale, is still very much not a global commodity. It's still point A to point B. It's still mostly pipeline. It's indexed to oil. So it's not really a, a, a gas uh, as a global commodity. But this will change. This will change because what's happening in the United States, what's happening uh, with the commissioning of LNG terminals in Australia, in Canada, they will all start exporting gas. And uh, uh, we can discuss when it will happen. I had the privilege to be in the in US, US a month ago in a hearing in the Senate where out of 15 senators, I didn't hear a single one who would question the need to speed up of uh, export opening from the US. There were some which, uh, not surprisingly, were asking for more investigation because they had some huge petrochemical plants in their senates, but, but in, in their in states, that's, that's understandable. But in general, I think uh, that uh, there's no more uh, the question if open uh, export of LNG from the US, it's rather when. Uh, so this market will develop, and uh, I think Europe will be well prepared we have already 22 LNG import terminals in Europe. By the end of this year, we'll have a 20, 23rd one in, in Lithuania. So we'll be well prepared, and this market will start to change. Uh, Lithuanian LNG will, will be a first 
uh, alternative route of supply of gas in our region. We are now 100% dependent since the beginning of uh, uh, next year. Uh, 20, 25% of gas will come from a different direction to Lithuania uh, with the potential to, to di diversify the supply of gas in Latvia and Estonia as well, because the Lithuanian NLG, LNG terminal will be a third party uh, open terminal. Uh, in two weeks, our, our infrastructural company will announce the tender to, to reserve uh, the transmission capacity. So any company could come buy the transmission capacity and sell gas if they have uh, customers. Of course, it's naive to say that, uh, that uh, everybody would rush to do that because no, there is no real market players right now, except for you know, old uh, Gazprom-related uh, companies. But uh, indications are quite good. We have already some companies uh, who give indications that they will come, they will participate, they will reserve uh, the, the terminal capacity, and they will be trading or using the gas from the terminal for their own needs in, in the region. So that's a good news. And, and uh, the good news is also that it's not the only project. It's, it, it has a very big synergy with other projects which will happen in the region. Uh, just yesterday I had a very good meeting with the Minister of Economy of Estonia. I heard about their plans to continue uh, working on a project uh, of uh, regional importance uh, uh, with Finland. They are thinking to have uh, two small scale. LNGs, there is a great synergy between uh, this uh, thinking and what uh, we will have by the end of this year in, in Lithuania, big scale and then two small scale uh, projects in, in Estonia and uh, Finland, Finland. Add to that the Baltic connector, the pipeline from Estonia to, to Finland, uh, strengthening of storage capacity in Latvia, strengthening the, the interconnectors between our countries, and then potentially building uh, the, uh, the, the interconnector between uh, Lithuania and Poland. That all makes sense. It's not that easy when speaking, for example, about the interconnector of Poland. We, we all have heard uh, this uh, uh, big political support for this project uh, uh, from all countries in, 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 uh, in this region, uh, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. So, so it was a little bit surprising for us when we heard from the companies how a big problem it is to get the paperwork done within the regulators. It is surprising that the regulators don't seem to match this uh, uh, point of view of, of governments of our, our uh, region that this is important. They rather seem not to support this kind of project, but maybe this is some transitional period they need to adjust to a new kind of uh, thinking when projects were not only considered as a beneficial for one country, but to look for a benefit for, for the region and to evalu evaluate that. Well, uh, one thing which I also want to mention is, uh, is what I heard a lot uh, yesterday and, and today is, uh, is uh, when we speak about sanctions and, and Russia and, and then at the same sentence we are using gas. It's a little bit frightening for, for, for Lithuania because we are 100% dependent on, on Russian gas right now. We cannot afford to stop by Russian gas. So we should first focus on what we can do uh, as our homework not not uh, immediately start hurting ourselves by you know stop buying russian gas but let's focus what we can do as a homework and that's first of all uh, our our common energy market we have uh, presented uh, the two two reports to to uh, energy council in december last uh, year as as a presidency they were all approved and 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 sure we said there that there's a lot of challenges uh, uh, to, to get to a common market, but we know what we need to do. We know that we have to have third energy package in, implemented. We have to have uh, interconnectors. Uh, so let's focus and do that. And, uh, and let's work, first of all, on what depends on us. Um, and one, one last point. Um, 
Third energy package is important, so we have transmission system operators so that we are able to connect to the system and to, to get alternative uh, gas to, to our customers, not only from Russia. But it's also important that we, we really uh, give a mandate to a commission to, to negotiate with Russia to, to implement the, the same set of rules uh, uh, on Russian companies which are applied to, to, to European companies. And I mean, uh, for example, uh, swap operation. Uh, how come that uh, Russians do business on, on uh, liberal European uh, rules, uh, do great business in Europe, but it's not possible even for German companies, not to speak about Lithuanian ones, to do a swap operation with, uh, I don't know, Azerbaijan, for example. It's not normal. So we should give a mandate to a commission to negotiate that and to, to, to give a list of these balances which we have and uh, to, to negotiate some kind of agreement, implementable agreement, not intentional one. And the last thing, uh, I was surprised to hear the, the, the comments uh, uh, coming out of a commission when uh, they were thinking about uh, uh, infringement procedure against Gazprom not to be understood as a way to punish Russia uh, because the, the, it should, should not be. It's surprising because uh, if there is a case for, for infringement notice, they should put it forward. So I really look forward that they do that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Balash, how, so, how does it look uh, from your country, from, from Hungary? You're close to the Western Balkans. In fact, your energy company has a dispute with Croatia, as I understand. And your prime minister uh, is, is uh, friendly with Mr. Putin. I mean, what, you know, what's going on in Hungary? Well, uh, I, I have uh, unfortunately to disappoint you because uh, uh, Mr. Orban is my prime minister, a Hungarian citizen, but he, uh, I am representing the European Commission, <laughs> and I, I, I will speak in, in that uh, uh, capacity. If there might be, uh, as I saw from the list of participants, some um, uh, representatives of the Hungarian embassy or government, I think I would leave it to them to react to this question. So. So let me uh, speak about how we're in a broader context about the issue of energy security. First of all, how much time has changed? When uh, up to recently we have spoken about energy security, it meant first of all physical security, availability of energy resources, possibly economic security at affordable prices, but it was rarely put, at least within the EU, in a core national security context. And this has now fundamentally changed uh, uh, in the last uh, uh, few months. The second point is that when we speak about energy security, then the security of whom? First of all, uh, and I think that we have to look at uh, at least from two uh, points of view. First of all, the security of the EU. And secondly, the security of our Eastern partners, countries like Ukraine, uh, Georgia, and Moldova, first of all, with whom we are uh, at the threshold of signing uh, wide-ranging uh, association agreements, which contain also a free trade um, a relationship and which was actually the triggering factor for whatever happened in Ukraine. So I think that we also, as EU, have to look after, uh, to the extent to help them and to, to support them to look into their Concerns. And this is vis-a-vis -vis Russia, where the importance of energy is, ex is Im almost impossible to overestimate. Uh, you gave, Michael, the figures about the dependence and importance of energy for Russia, both in export and in budgetary incomes. I would add that the policies which increasingly treat uh, energy as a hard tool of power of the government, not as an economic uh, issue or as a business issue, but as a direct tool of the government. I, uh, there are, if, if I look at the three major um, types of energy where there are links between the uh, Europe in broader sense and Russia, we see three huge companies, Gazprom for gas, 
Rosneft, which is oil, but increasingly active in gas as well, and Rosatom, which is an industrial military complex when it comes to an anything to do with nuclear, nuclear fuel, or nuclear equipment. Each of these three companies are under the direct, whatever is being said, under the direct uh, uh, the guidance, direct management of, of the Kremlin, and they do not behave as a business corporation, but they behave, unfortunately, as uh, tools of the uh, uh, government. What uh, does it mean? First of all, when it comes to the physical availability of energy, Russia emphasizes uh, correctly that at least the EU was not, not yet, affected by turning of the taps, at least not directly the indirect effects which happened in 2006 and 2009 due to the uh, uh, dispute between Ukraine and, uh, and Russia were not directed against the EU. Uh, Russia likes to emphasize that they are and they will, uh, will remain a reliable supplier, which is of course nice to hear and we hope that this will be the case, but this is not necessarily true for our Eastern partners. When it comes especially to Ukraine or Georgia or Moldova, each have heard quite publicly voiced uh, threats about the possibility of being physically cut off from crucial important supplies. And this is part of the pressure being put on Russia on these countries. My personal view is that whatever happens in and around Ukraine, Russia would do its utmost not to cut off the physical uh, supply of gas to EU in, in order not to give even a further boost to the diversification efforts, mm -hmm. which are anyway uh, underway and now being looked at with new attention uh, due to the, what has, happening and, and is, uh, has happened and is happening every day in Ukraine. The second aspect is the price or cost of energy, be it gas, but especially gas, as an, a means of economic pressure. We all followed with amazement the extremely unique uh, situation of the gas market when it comes to Ukraine. Prices at the, uh, uh, in a moment can jump up or, up or down 30-35%, depending on the uh, political decisions. Uh, Ukraine has paid uh, very heavily for uh, gas uh, in the uh, last few months until November. W once uh, President, then President Yanukovych decided not to sign the agreement with the EU, suddenly the, cry, uh, the price of gas has been dropped from $465 um, uh, dollars per, per thousand cubic meter to $285. Uh, uh, dollars. And it remained there until very recently when suddenly the same uh, uh, the price jumped back to the uh, original level. All this is, as we hear, are the business decisions of Gazprom. Now, I, probably I'm not alone to say that this is not extremely credible and I would add it's not even in line with Russia's obligation as a recent member of the WTO. Sure. You can maintain monopolies, uh, the GATT rules specifically allow it, but these monopolies should act under commercial considerations. I never saw such jumps in the, inter in the gas prices in the last six to seven months, which would justify such uh, jumps of up and down of prices when it comes to supplies, for instance, to Ukraine which could be based on commercial uh, considerations. There are also a number of other issues where we have problems uh, with Russia now speaking we about the EU. For instance, they apply export duties, which as you mentioned is a major source of uh, incomes in an interesting manner uh, in uh, the East when it comes to exports to, the, uh, to Asia or to China much lower or some uh, uh, export duties are applied than when it comes to gas exported to the West towards the EU. 
this again raises very serious uh, uh, legal questions and which we are actively uh, uh, looking at. The third element is the way the Russian companies, this mentioned monopolies and especially Gazprom, behave abroad, including in the EU. Gazprom is, as it's well known, is a monopoly when it comes both to exports and ownership and use of the gas network within Russia. And uh, unfortunately, Gazprom, when it comes also to the EU market, applies uh, this kind of monopolistic anti-competitive practices. And this is now the subject of an uh, ongoing competition investigation. I cannot and don't, don't even try to judge that when the results of this investigation would be out, but I think it's not very uh, far away. What is clear, however, that this investigation looks at such issues as restrictions of resale of gas among countries, which is totally against the basic spirit of the internal market and free flow of, of products. The uh, long-term fixing of, of prices, if you like, uh, uh, using the dependence of some member uh, states. But I would add, which is not part of the investigation, the way uh, Russia deals with transit of gas. It's extremely difficult to buy directly gas, Kazakh or Turkmen gas uh, by European companies because the, this uh, gas should cross Russia and interestingly, there are always capacity problems if it uh, comes to transit. <laughs> if it comes to selling to Gazprom, and then Gazprom reselling this gas to, to, to the EU, then these problems are uh, resolved. Uh, Russia is also, and the minister has referred to it, also doesn't like to play according to the rules of the uh, EU internal market when it comes to the energy unbundling which simply means that due to competition uh, uh, considerations under the third energy pa uh, package, the producers and uh, the transmission of, of gas should be split to avoid this kind of abuse. Russia is extremely unhappy about it and permanently asks for exceptions and exemptions, which is not available even for European companies. So to sum up, we have a number of issues where, which really put into the focus the question of security. This is certainly not the EU's choice that we are in such a situation. We would much prefer a cooperative approach uh, with Russia, but it is uh, unfortunately the Russian policies, the Russian politics, be it foreign policies or be it economic policies, which I have referred to, which put in the focus or uh, this, uh, the issue of, uh, of energy security, be it for the EU or be it for our Eastern partners. Thanks. Thank you. I was, I was amused when I read the other day that the Russians were threatening to take the US to, uh, to, to lodge a complaint at the WTO against the US, and then I hear your laundry list of uh, <laughs> practices that the Russians could be, could be taken to uh, the WTO about. Um, Matt, tie it all together politically. I mean, we've heard over and over, all four of the speakers so far have directly addressed the question of not only what we can do, but the will to do it. Yeah. And I have to ask myself, especially after hearing what Mr. Balas just said, it's, it's just so logical and so clear what the EU should be doing to defend its own interests. I have to ask, why does it take so long? Yeah. Yes, there are 28 members with differing <laughs> interests. Why is it taking the US? Perhaps not quite as long, but too long to get export licenses. Tell us what you see as the, as the overarching political theme of this economic question. Great, Mike. Thanks so much for a great question. And thank you for honoring us by being with, with us today on this panel. These are obviously four of the sharpest minds you'll ever encounter on these issues. And some of them have done some heroic things, whether it's right now, Yaroslav, what you're doing to implement the third energy package. Uh, Alan, what you talk about uh, when you confront the, the realities of the deep corruption within Gazprom and its nexus with organized crime and with uh, political manipulation. And Václav, what you did, actually, I'd like to say we 
a little bit did together, my, our own humble contributions in Washington to your success in getting the gas turned back on in 2009. And so that is actually, believe it or not, beginning to answer your question, Mike. Um, for a long time, uh, paradoxically, it was the United States that was pushing very hard, I mean, for eight, nine years, for these sorts of measures to be undertaken. And I, uh, uh, I'll never forget two statements, one by President Bush and one by former Energy Commissioner Peebles, which was, well, why does the U.S. care so much more than Europe seems to care? And I think the answer uh, back then, particularly before this current crisis in Ukraine, uh, was twofold. One, um, it was an inconvenient truth to have to confront Gazprom, especially for Germany, uh, when so many industrial interests and lobbies and export interests are tied to the Russian market. That was an inconvenient truth. Uh, and it's also a very complex issue, as, we, as we've been talking about here. There are so many aspects and types of infrastructure that need to be developed. Liquid natural gas, pipelines, interconnectors, storage. Uh, it, it's displacement of gas by coal. That comes into contact with a confrontation sometimes with the European Union's own uh, climate uh, regulations. So this is an extremely complex issue that's hard to follow. And I would argue the Russian government has done a brilliant job in exploiting that complexity and and, and turning us in a circle, having us chase our own tail for a long time. The great news is that is obviously changing now uh, because of what's happening in Ukraine. But even better news is it began to change uh, under this energy commissioner, uh, Gunter Oettinger. <clears throat> and we've been, everybody's talked about the need for there to be a, a unified European energy market. And I'm, I'm going to argue, in fact, I'm going to focus on that now in a parsimonious way to simplify uh, and make the point that this is, this is the way you slay the, the Gazprom monopolistic dragon once and for all. And it's the only way to create a real, genuine market uh, that works according to the principles of supply and demand rather than to the mon according to the monopolistic principles of long-term natural gas contracts that are tied to the price of oil. All right, so what does that mean? And why, why, why is there not a market for natural gas for those of you who don't spend so much time on these issues as we do? <coughs> um, the reason that has to do with, with the different types of energy. Oil is very easy to put on a ship and send anywhere. And uh, so it's, it's liquid, not just in the physical sense, but it's a very liquid commodity. And there's a highly developed international market uh, a little bit differentiated geographically. If you look at you know, the, the commodities prices, they're always quoted in the, the West Texas Intermediate or the New York Stock Exchange, uh, for Commodities Exchange price for American oil versus Brent uh, European oil. But generally, oil is traded uh, in a very liquid way. Natural gas can't be, because those little molecules, you can't, unless you liquefy them, which is finally becoming affordable, but it's still at great cost, they escape, so you have to generally, the cheapest way to, to export gas or move it is point to point through pipelines that are extremely expensive uh, and require long-term investments, 10 to 20 years, and tie the countries together. Um, so uh, the Russian side has been extremely clever, as I said, in exploiting this, this reality of natural gas. I just, about seven years ago, recall, I'll never forget this conversation with a very senior Russian official. And I, I'm not going to say, obviously, who it was. Very senior. And he said to me, now, you Americans, you can be nice and soft. Uh, your diplomats can be. Uh, and that's because you know you're so strong. And we, deep down inside, know we're not so strong. We know we're weak. And when we have an advantage, we're going to fight to the death for that advantage. And energy <coughs> is that issue, is one of the issues for us, especially natural gas. So it's an artificial distinction to say, does the Russian side use natural gas as a geopolitical tool or as an economic tool? Those are one and the same issue. Uh, and that has been possible because for so long, there was such a monopoly in Europe of import supply uh, from Russia. I mean, of course, Norway is a major uh, gas supplier into the EU, but outside of, outside of Norway and the European Union's own supplies, some gas comes from North Africa. But the biggest additional supplier, of course, has been Russia for a long time. And because the market is not developed, for years, uh, Gazprom was able to do something amazing, which is buy gas quite cheap in Central Asia and ship that gas to Europe and charge European consumers triple or even quadruple the price. 
And that, I, I recall a lot of uh, my, my colleagues, this is back about 10 years ago in Europe, saying, well, well we don't want to rock the boat. It's OK. Uh, we just want to make sure the gas keeps flowing. To which I had replied, do you think your electorate feels the same way? They're paying triple or quadruple what they need to pay or triple the price in the United States where there's a real market? Do you think your voters really think that's fair? And plus there's this geopolitical element of Russia potentially <coughs> manipulating the market. Oh, no, Russia's a reliable supplier. Okay, so we argued about that for a long time. And then in 2006, um, there was the first cutoff on January 1st of Russian gas to Ukraine and the EU. And this story... Uh, which will be very brief, shows the nexus between organized crime, uh, Gazprom, and, and Russian politics, and Ukrainian politics. So the gas was cut off, and suddenly, out of nowhere, a shadowy company appeared, happened to be based in Budapest, although you're representing, of course, the, the commission, I know. <laughs> um, happened to be based in Budapest, but it was also a Swiss company run by a Russian guy named Semyon Mogilevich, who, at the, called Rosu Kronergo, who got the gas turned back on. Uh, and so this is five years, not even five, four, four and a half years after September 11th. Uh, you can imagine U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, had a lot of really nasty people on their FBI top 10 most wanted list, people who wanted to kill a lot of Americans. Mr. Mogilevich, this businessman, was on that list. He was on that list. So what that shows, again, is how organized crime, geopolitics, uh, fueling of, uh, with, through giant rents, this regime that, that President Putin was putting together, all come together on this issue. And that's perpetuated in Ukraine today, as we heard from Vaclav. There has been no significant reform, uh, no reform really at all, of the, of the Ukrainian energy sector, which remains a huge vulnerability economically for Ukraine, but also politically. So what is to be done? What is to be done, I think, is uh, everything we've heard here, but in a nutshell, it's that Europe continues doing what it has been doing under Commissioner Oettinger for these last few years. Creates a genuine, integrated, uh, unified market for natural gas. And that's difficult. There needs to be political will. But the good news is it has actually happened in part of Europe, in Northwest Europe, around the North Sea. Um, gas trading hubs, six or so or seven, have, have emerged over the course of the last well, decade and a half, uh, even the last 20 years, stretching from the United Kingdom, the national balance point, uh, through France and Belgium, Netherlands, and Germany. And so these are places where pipelines converge, uh, liquid nat natural gas terminals converge, there are storage facilities, and there are regulations in place and, and actual trading hubs so that free market trading can occur. And so I'd just like to highlight two points about, about this. One, um, the natural gas price in France, in France is differentiated. It's natural gas is 20% cheaper in northern France than in southern France. And that's because in northern France, there's access to these gas trading hubs. Market forces bring down the price, including the Gazprom price. Um, so I talked about that the enormous arbitrage opportunity that Gazprom took advantage of for years. That's going away. And European Union member states are being able to, to force lower prices, and they're fighting rightfully to break this connection between the price of oil and the price of gas. That's important because per unit of energy, oil is generally much more expensive than gas. So you see the impact of the market in northern France vis-a-vis -vis southern France. Uh, second point is, since about 2008, the spot market price at those natural gas trading hubs uh, in northwestern Europe has converged. So that's technical mumbo jumbo. What does that mean? It means no matter what, which of those hubs you go to, you're going to pay the same price on any given day for that natural gas. That's called a real market. And in those circumstances, <clears throat> no matter how nasty a monopolist wants to be, he or she is not going to succeed because the market is going to decide what the price is. It's heavily localized, but it's possible to advance, uh, to advance that practice and hopefully to here. So my last set of points is to bring everything back here to Minister Nevarovich, to his counterparts here in the Baltic states. Um, we all believe in the Euro-Atlantic communities more than a slogan, it, it, it's, it's philosophy, it's theology, that we are recreating or have recreated a Europe whole and free uh, and at peace. It's not true here. The Baltic states uh, are not part of a whole Europe when it comes to energy, because other than two subsea uh, electricity uh, cables connecting Estonia with Finland, and thanks to Ellering, one of our sponsors. Otherwise, uh, the Baltic states are completely disconnected from any European energy system. 
And in fact, the electricity grid of the Baltic states is synchronized and integrated with Russia's electricity grid, not with the EU's. There are plans to change that, plans to invest a lot of money so that eventually there'll be the interconnections, first between Lithuania and Poland, and then between um, uh, Lithuania and Sweden to complement what the Estonians and the Finns have already done. Um, hopefully, there's going to be gas interconnections, the Lithuanian-Polish interconnection, though that's still under consideration and a debate. Um, but for now, there is no interconnection. Um, the EU, of course, is on top of the problem. They're, they have the, well, the Baltic <coughs> Energy Market in, uh, Integration Plan, BMIP, that uh, pledges money for projects of common interest to build the interconnections we talked about, uh, to strengthen the storage facility that Yaroslav talked about in, in Latvia, uh, to create new diversified supply opportunities through liquid natural gas terminals, building on Lithuania's lead, probably going to be two smaller terminals, one in Estonia, one in Finland. Um, the pieces are starting to come together, but for now, for now, the Baltic states are disconnected from Europe. Um, but if and when these pieces all come together, which cost money, uh, then we will see Gazprom no longer having the ability to do what it has done to Lithuania uh, in the last couple of years, as admitted by uh, Vice President of Gazprom. Um, they uh, elevated the price significantly to Lithuania, and he came out and said, yes, we are doing this essentially as punishment to Lithuania because Lithuania is proceeding with the EU's own policy of implementing its anti-monopolistic uh, rules and regulations. So Russia is going to punish Lithuania for being a good member of the European Union. That's outrageous. And that, those opportunities will vanish, as I said, once these market interconnections are built. These are midterm solutions in the short term. Um, if we get to a crisis whereby Russia decides to cut off the gas to punish Europe, Europe will suffer. It'll be painful. It'll be expensive to do the switching out of various types of fuel that Alan was talking about. But in the end, it's going to hurt Russia a lot more because their economy is so dependent on those revenues and the economy in both transparent or, or uh, I mean, not transparent, but in terms of the light of day and in a more shadowy way will remain dependent on those revenues for a long time. Thank you. Well, that was, that was a super summary, Matt. I, you know, parenthetically, you're talking about the early 90s, I guess, and, and, and what might have been done. I don't want to get into what we colloquially call in the, in the States a coulda, woulda, shoulda question. Ronald Reagan was certainly not one of my favorites, uh, as anybody who knows me knows. But I have to admit, in the early 80s, his administration was warning big time against construction of gas pipelines to Russia because of potential blackmail. So even he was right sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, ha what happens if the European Union continues doing what it's doing, even speeds it up and creates a unified gas market, and then China and India just simply agree to pay the United States 40% more for its LNG than the Europeans are paying? I, I, if that's a question to me. I, I think that's fantastic. As an American, I think, uh, number one, um, it's ridiculous that until now there have been these prohibitions against the export of U.S. liquid natural gas. Mm -hmm. I, I thought we believed in free trade <laughs> and the free market, <laughs> and I understand protectionism, of course, but uh, if, if that gas can't find its way to the highest paying market, it's going to be, well, it's not going to be produced in the U.S. at some point. So it's, it's great if the Chinese or Indians are willing to pay more because Europe's going to do fine. Europe's got a, it has great shale gas uh, possibilities, but there's plenty more gas that's going to be coming to Europe, much more from Azerbaijan over the next few years. Um, I think we're going to see, by the way, the Turkmenistanis soon um, maybe agreeing to move at least a chunk, another 10 BCM of their gas, or the same amount of new gas that's going to come from Azerbaijan, I think Turkmenistan's going to agree to send westward because now that the pipeline is going to be built, clearly we know, between Azerbaijan, across Georgia, Turkey, and then across Greece, Albania, and into Italy, I think the Turkmenistanis realize, huh, the Russians are going to hurt us if we defy <coughs> them and send our gas westward. 
but only for a limited amount of time because soon we're going to have uh, all the revenues and the connectivity to, to Europe with this pipeline. So there'll be more gas from Turkmenistan, more gas from northern Iraq, as we've heard, and, and I hope a lot of gas from eastern Mediterranean because actually I'm on the board of a Turkish company that's trying to <laughs> build a pipeline from Israel to Turkey that also involves Cyprus. So I think Europe will be okay on natural gas. I mean, the projections of uh, gas demand in Europe, which are way down after the 2008 crisis, are that full pre-2008 levels of demand will only recover later, maybe around 2020. So we've got some breathing space if we don't get into this gas Armageddon situation of Russia cutting off the supplies. Alan, you brought, before you, 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 go, you jump in, I'd like to get back to one thing that you emphasized, namely the environmental impacts. Yeah. The U.S., because it's, it's exploiting its natural gas more, can now export its coal. Coal is dirtier, CO2 emissions in the EU are going up, actually higher than in the US last year, I'm told. Uh, all sorts of problems. The UN comes out with a report about global warming a few weeks ago that was pretty scary. Mm -hmm. I mean, admittedly, it's not gonna happen as quickly as a Russian push into Donetsk, maybe, but it's <laughs> clearly happening. <laughs> My question is whether or not you see, since, since the politics is intimately tied in with the, the natural science here, if you see Russia, they've already, I'm told, lobbied pretty heavily in Brussels against, uh, against fracking, against hydraulic fracturing, because they're good environmentalists, <laughs> undoubtedly. Um, do you see, uh, uh, what are the political ramifications, political ramifications of the environmental? I mean, this is a big movement, both in the United States and especially in parts of Europe. Is this going to, is this, you know, should we be worried about that? Is Real Politiker? Well, I'm told, actually, that um, there is about, uh, it's often said there are very few shale gas drilling rigs in Europe. And if you include Russia as part of Europe, that's not true. There's about 80 shale rigs, apparently, now in, in, in Russia. So you use largely for shale oil, but, you know, they're doing hydraulic fracturing, they're doing all these things. And, and actually, if you look at the Russian pipeline network, one of the major criticisms of, about shale gas development is the prospect of methane emissions. But the Russian gas pipeline, the major, major UGGS network, the main Russian gas network, is very old, it's very leaky, and there are, if you ask me, where in the world is the wor most environmentally unfriendly transit of gas operation? It's in Russia. So perhaps, actually, on environmental grounds alone, we should stop using mm. environmentally unfriendly, leaky mm. Russian gas mm. and produce our own <laughs> domestically produced organic shale gas, which actually we, we can make sure we don't have the methane emissions, we can use green completions, we can make sure everything's done in an environmentally sort of way. Surely we should use free trade organic shale gas in Europe <laughs> and not like this, this terribly term. dirty uh, gas prom gas with all this leaking from d oil pipelines. Wow. And that's one, um, uh, w w one issue with, with all of this. Well, you've convinced me. <laughs> I'm not sure at the meeting of the Greens, though, that you might... Well, well let me, let me, I, I can take, come back on the Greens. One of the points about this is that there are, there are two levels of issues. I am not actually advocating a dash for coal. <laughs> what I'm saying is that in an emergency situation, this is what I was saying earlier about we're no longer in a situation of, of peacetime. This is at least an <coughs> emergency situation. We may have to do things which we would never ordinarily contemplate. Uh, and, and one of the issues I was saying about uh, suspending the large combustion plant directive, which controls all of the, uh, the closing down of all of the dirtiest coal-fired power stations, is that actually in an emergency situation, I think the UK has got about six gigawatts, at least six gigawatts of retired recently retired capacity, which we may be able to bring back online, uh, that would leave more gas for other European states. And in terms of an emergency cooperative measures, those are the sort of things you might want to do. Uh, and we'd say to the Green, uh, a lot of the, 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 the Green argument is, look, this is not something that we're going to continue. This is an emergency temporary measure. Where I think there is an opportunity of bringing on board uh, a large part of the Green movement and um, actually getting effective measures is this issue about permitting and planning. Um, mm. Because there, both shale gas and wind power suffer from the same problems. It's you know, the, the difficulty of rollout, the difficulty of actually getting anything done in any reasonable time frame. Uh, and there, you could actually get, get a, a, I think, a significant degree of cooperation with a large part of the, of the Green Movement, that we are going to introduce streamlined permitting and planning measures. We're going to allow these things to go forward very quickly because we need to do them to protect our supply security. 
uh, and that the, with part of the intention is that we will then actually m move much more rapidly as these have come on stream to take out more of the coal capacity. And I think that, of, of, of the coal-fired power capacity, and I think there is a deal to be done there which actually works with our supply security, reduces our CO2 emissions, uh, and brings most of the European political establishment together on that. You have squared the circle. Tried to, I, think we can, we, I think we can get there with goodwill. We're going to turn it to the audience now. I'd ask for the benefit of our international viewers that you identify yourselves. I saw two hands in the back, Henrik Locks first, and then the gentleman just over there, yes. And then we'll do two at a time, and then I'll get down to Mr. Goff and, do, and to Bruce Jackson after that. Yes, please. Thomas Simolavitas from Africa. Well, that wasn't what I meant. I meant Mr. Locks right back oh, there. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks to you all, all in the panel. Uh, one you want to identify yourself to our yes, worldwide uh, audience. Please. I'm Hendrik Lux. I'm a retired member of the European Parliament. Uh, at least uh, Yaroslav and Matt, it sounded like you took it for granted that the LNG terminals, uh, that there should be two small ones, one in Estonia and one in Finland. But what is the real interest for the whole region? Supply is the one side and the price is another. One big terminal, as far as I understand, would allow big LNG carriers, big vessels to bypass uh, Rotterdam, for instance, and would certainly affect the price level for the whole Baltic Sea region. Isn't that argument at all uh, under consideration? Thank you. Is that Mr. Elliman Jensen? I can't really see. I have a very direct question to the panel. And the moderator was so right in pointing out that back in the early 80s, we discussed this. I was in La Sapinière, Canada, in 1982, when George Schultz outlined for the European foreign ministers the risk of building these gas pipelines. Yeah. And the picture he painted, oh my God, it was a much milder version of what we're actually seeing today. Now, we got the Nord Stream. And some five years ago, there was a plan, a study made, on how to build the so-called Amber Pipeline, going from northern Germany through Poland to the Baltic countries, in order to make sure that the Baltic countries should not be what they are now, an island when it comes to natural gas. So my question is the following. We all know who was bribed by whom in order to make sure that the Nord Stream was built. Who might have been bribed by whom to spike the amber pipeline system because it has been systematically preventing from going from the drawing board? We have uh, libel lawyers listening, so that'll be good. To... <laughs> all, right. all right, please answer these two questions, then we'll go to the next two. Yeah. Well, essentially, those two questions uh, are directly related, I think. Uh, if we speak about the LNG terminals, uh, then uh, our terminal will be quite large to cover the, uh, the whole demand in Lithuania and also possibly if we have also alternative uh, supply via pipeline to, to get gas to our neighbors as well. Uh, it is not for me to judge uh, how economic uh, will be the, the projects which Estonia and Finland are now proceeding to, to negotiate. I think uh, if they do that, they, they see the business case for that. And uh, I'm sure once they reach an agreement, they, they, they should be successful in convincing uh, commission to allocate uh, the money for it. Because this is, uh, it's, it's all, all about this process. This is uh, the first time, and that's also the answer to the second question, that's the first time we are now able to, to build this infrastructure, which then it was called uh, Amber, uh, pipeline. Now it's uh, called uh, Gippel or, or, uh, uh, or other words. Uh, uh, and we can, we can, with the help of Connecting Europe facility, uh, build this infrastructure. Otherwise, our 
business, our consumers uh, uh, are not so strong to finance these uh, huge infrastructural projects. It's, it's simply too, too big investments, too, too expensive to cover from the tariff. So connecting Euro facility is essential. And, and so it is very important that we cooperate and uh, take benefit of this first in history uh, financing instrument from, from the Commission uh, to interconnect our countries. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, we need not to worry about who bribes uh, whom, but to make all the efforts that all the political decora declarations are implemented by the companies and the regulators are helping and not blocking this. You know, yes, Matt. Oh, thanks, Mike. Yeah, um, I very much agree with the thrust of your question, uh, Mr. Lux, that uh, building two small LNG terminals can never make nearly as much commercial sense as building one large one and then connecting it with a subsea pipeline you know, across the Gulf of Finland, which if you do, you will then create the basic foundation for a real natural gas market here in the Baltic states. Separately, it's too small, the Baltic states, to have this free market trading of natural gas. The market's too small, maybe, I guess, about four and a half billion cubic meters. Uh, Finland, five and a half. If you connect them, you can really do uh, natural gas trading uh, as we work towards, step by step, year by year, the fully integrated single European energy market. Uh, as for Amberstream, I asked Mr. Minister, that's a, a great question. I, I, don't, I don't know who by whom besides, besides the obvious uh, one person in particular, um, <laughs> but I won't mention him. Um, and I don't know, I, don't, I wasn't involved in the, you know, the demise, of, obviously, of Amberstream, but I, I, I do recall quite clearly how our approach in Washington was uh, to work with the frontline states here in the Baltics and Poland uh, to make sure that, and Ukraine, all you, these countries use their or your uh, geography to compel Gazprom to behave according to market principles. In other words, Gazprom really wants to keep flowing and increase the flow of gas to Europe. Okay, the cost for doing that and crossing our territory is that you're gonna have to behave according to market principles. And the one thing we worried about that could happen would be that uh, Gazprom would decide to bypass all of these countries, and it did. And that's what the Nord Stream pipeline is, the direct line uh, between Russia and, and Germany, which me as a Polish-American who was raised in a pretty ethnic community is, is the worst nightmare you can have. You know, Poland and the Baltic states being bypassed. And you all remember what uh, then Defense Minister Radek Sikorsky called that pipeline. Uh, uh, whatever. He called it the Molotov-Ribbentrop pipeline, the, the Nord Stream pipeline. So that's why Amber Stream died. And the last point on that is I remember I, uh, I had a meeting at the State Department with uh, Alexander Medvedev, who's uh, you know, number two at Gazprom. And I asked him what, you know, naively, but I, I think I knew what I was doing. I said, well, why don't you just work with all these countries, with Ukraine and the Baltic states, and build your infrastructure across their territory? That'll be a lot cheaper than the subsea pipeline. And he just, he coughed and kind of looked down and he said, well, we, this will be much easier this way. Well, it's interesting <laughs> you bring that up because uh, Mr. Medvedev spoke at, at the Council on Foreign Relations a few years ago, and I asked him the same question. Oh. I kid you not what his response was. We, he said, we want to be sure that the Baltic states don't cut off the <laughs> gas to Western Europe. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, uh, Václav. If, if I may ju just briefly on the issue who grabbed whom. Look, <coughs> it would be beautiful if, if it was only Russian agents starting the work in Europe. The real truth in our part of Europe, Central and East, the biggest enemy is not Russia, it's us, our laziness, unwillingness to work, and competence. Let's be honest about it, okay? Russians would have great difficulties to achieve what we ourselves achieve in harming ourselves. We have built the Gaza pipeline that was opened last year in January. It, had, it was a real project. It had 140,000 pages of documentation. It, it cost 400 million euros, private money. It took six weeks to get financing because it's regulated business. Banks love it. Now, you remember when I was approached by Bulgarian government a few years back, five years back, about the pipeline from Bulgaria to possible LNG plant in Thessaloniki. And everything they had was a small drawing on a napkin. <laughs> and guess what? It never happened. Nice. So work, work, work. Uchica, uchica, uchica. Let me just say before I call on the next is that we are now officially on um, injury time. So 
we, we don't have a whole lot of time, and I'd like you to be very brief, Mr. Goff first. And then the gentleman whom I ripped, had the microphone ripped cruelly out of his hands will be sitting next. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Uh, John Luff, Ch Chatham House. Um, I just want to pick up on, on a point that uh, Matt made, and, and that is about the importance of uh, revenues from uh, European gas sales to, to the, the Russian budget. This does actually need to be put in context, and Mr. Putin did this rather perfectly last week when he was asked a, a question uh, during this, his, his mammoth um, direct line interview, the four-hour uh, thing. A, a pensioner from uh, Tambov uh, asked him, what happens if the Europeans stop buying our gas? Is this going to affect our pensions? Wow. And the way, the way he answered that question was by talking about the Im importance of revenues from oil sales, uh, yeah. which he said are $191 billion, yeah. and from gas they are 28 that's worth thinking about if we are looking at measures to harm the Russian economy uh, or at least dissuade Mr. Putin from doing certain things because uh, there is going to be a crisis of, a crisis of investment in the Russian oil industry. And uh, we probably have the, the potential to impact that because technology transfers required heavy capital investment, obviously Western banks were the uh, in, in international oil companies. But then we have to think about how that will impact BP, Shell, Exxon and others. So just worth musing on. Thank you. Excellent point. This gentleman now has the floor. Okay. Thomas Simonaritas from EPCO. I'm surprised not to have heard two words, South Stream and Algeria. France is taking a lot of its natural gas from Algeria. Is there any possibility to, provi to uh, provide gas to the rest of Europe? And uh, South Stream, what's going to happen to this project and what especially is... Uh, uh, the attitude of the European Commission. I understand there's a certain number of legal challenges, not even mentioning the political ones. Okay, could we have quick answers, low so we can get two more questions before we break for lunch? Who would like to take it? Yes. Okay, Alan. let me just take it on the Gazprom revenues to start with. One of my concerns about this is if Russia is now a revanchist destabilizing state, do they really consider simply oil is the money, gas is the power, and gas is essentially a dispensable political tool for leverage. So it is they're much more willing to use it disruptively and are not going to worry about the revenues. That, and also you could argue, if we're disruptive about gas, we'll probably increase the oil price. So we'll make more money anyhow. <laughs> so there is, a, there is a sense in which we, our entire approach of assuming a commercial incentive to maintain gas flows is not necessarily really of that great importance. Let me tell you something else I was told uh, a while ago, and I can't tell you by whom, but I was told that there was a serious consideration in Moscow when the Gazprom antitrust case started to simply bankrupt the company as a way of avoiding EU liabilities. Now, the point I make about that is to illustrate the way that with gas, there's a willingness to be, to treat it as a dispensable political tool, even to the extent of the company being dispensable. Now, if they're willing to do that, I think they may well be willing to simply use it as an ultimate political tool and not think about the revenues because of the difference between the revenues from oil and the revenues from gas. I think that's really important. Well, that's going to shatter a lot of illusions in Europe, yeah. it seems to me, yeah. what you just said. I think there is, I think, I, and I think the, the, I think it was always possible, but once you, the Russians move in this much more revanchist way, they could do that. I think the other point is on the South Stream issue. I think this is really very, very important. The, the, what is, I think South Stream is now another means, an energy means of probing and testing the European Union. Will it comply, comply with its still, its rules? Will it apply EU law? Will it simply ignore the, um, the, uh, the rules in order to get the gas from us? That's going to be a game. I think one of the tests we may well see is they may start talking about putting South Stream through Crimea. It is much cheaper to do that, but also it's a way of testing the Europeans. Will you take gas from mm -hmm. occupied territory? Mm -hmm. Will you do that? And then Algeria. Thomas, you are entirely right. There is the, the Algerians have enormous amounts of gas. Uh, the, there's a figure the Algerian energy minister gave for their technically recoverable shale gas resources of being something like 25,000 trillion cubic feet of shale gas 
which is so large I can't even work out how much that is. So it's amazing. So, so the point about it is, is that, that there is an issue there. There may be a NATO issue in terms of helping Algeria to maintain its security, right. but potentially you've got an, on our doorstep a huge, huge gas resource. And that's something which could be really attractive for us to develop and work with over the next few years. Thank you. Bruce had his hand up. Bruce Jackson right there. Yeah. And then this gentleman in the front. We're going to have to go. Oh, that gentleman in the back, too. We're going to, I'm going to take four more, but I mean really concise questions. I want to come back to the candy question that uh, Ambassador Bartuska raised. The end user of the $7 billion you talked about is Ukrainian politics. That's where it goes. It cost a billion dollars to win a, for either party to win an election in Ukraine. That, there's no donor base for that. So you don't get to political office without already pre-borrowed the money. So they took the, they, they took the candy earlier, years ago. <laughs> the only purpose to be in office is to pay off the debt to the people that lent them the money. So it's like, like cocaine in America. You can correct supply, but you've got to do something about demand. Gentleman in the back has had his hand up the longest, I think. And I can't, I probably <coughs> know you, but I can't see you from here. It's Nick, Nick Gowing. Yeah. Um, okay. Gas Armageddon, Matt. Yeah. Uh, and the imperative now politically. Let me introduce another element, which is politics and the public perception. The public won't understand a lot of this technical stuff. Next autumn, they'll expect to be able to switch on their machines and the gas will come out at the right price. In Britain, we've had uproar with the utility companies charging far too much. i therefore like to hear from anyone up there about the real sense of political urgency about this because we're going to sleepwalk into a major political challenge for every single government and politicians do not want unhappy uh, customers and those who vote for them who are going to vote against them because they can't get gas at the right price. I'm going to give these last two questions to this gentleman and then Vlad Sokor uh, and then I lose some friends over here, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Philip Blonde, uh, Res Publica, uh, uh, London. My, my, my question really is the point that Alan's raised, and that's how our immediate response to the energy crisis, coal, conspires against our intermediate response, shale gas. Mm. Because I think the real barrier to mass development at scale of shale gas isn't perhaps planning, it's environmental political resistance mm. across the whole spectrum. Mm. And what they argue, and they're right in this, is that the development of shale gas essentially depresses the price of coal to such an extent that coal and dirty coal becomes mass exportable commodity. The answer for Europeans is, OK, develop shale gas, but then we just push coal out again to somewhere else in the world. So if we're going to win this politically, and I think that's the major barrier for mass development of shale gas, we have to have an answer to the coal problem if we're going to get to the, to the shale goal. Coupled with that, what I'd, ask, I'd like to ask that the panel is, is what can we do about that? Because unless we can unlock that, we're not going to unlock the political barriers to the shale goal we want. Thank you. Vlad Sokor, last question. Short, Vlad. Vladimir Sokor, Jamestown Foundation. What was Putin omitted to say in his speech is that a large portion of Gazprom's foreign revenue is being used to subsidize internal consumption of gas by the population and the industry. And therefore, loss of revenue would affect Russia's social contract and would affect the competitiveness of Russian industry. But uh, I wanted to ask a question to any and all panelists. It is about... Uh, uh, Gazprom's takeover of Wintershals gas distribution business in Germany in December. Uh, Gazprom's uh, taking over of the operatorship of major gas storage sites in northwestern Germany. Uh, and uh, the co ownership of Gazprom in the Opal and Nell pipelines, which have the status or aspire to the status of interconnectors between Nord Stream and consumers in continental Europe. So the question is to any and all panelists, how does this square with the third energy package? Is oh. Germany obtaining systematic exemptions from the application of the third energy package? Okay, we had three, we had one statement and, or maybe two and three questions. Um, I leave it up to, yes, Matt first and then sure. Alan and I can't. Uh, yeah, um, picking up on the last point and Nick's point, um, 
I think the answer is, is actually Germany is going to decide uh, whether or not the political will is going to be urgent enough. And right now, I'm, I'm not confident it's going to make the right decision. Uh, and yes, as Vlad, you point out, Germany is very happy to sell at everybody else down the river if, if it's good for German companies. Uh, and that's you know, been a problem, though, of many EU member states as well. Uh, we talk about collective security. Collective security means putting the collective security ahead of your own. And even right here in the Baltic states, it happens all the time. Yaroslav and I were talking about this yesterday. So that spirit of really collective responsibility is absent, and you get this situation in, uh, in Germany. But I will defer to EU officials uh, to comment on what, what will happen in terms of countermeasures. Uh, and the only other thing I want to talk about, just for one second, on the revenues that, that President Putin has said, the 28 billion for gas. Our institute here has a much different figure, which is around $66 billion for the 162 BCM that are uh, imported into Europe. So uh, there's some discrepancy on figures. I think it's very much in the Russian president's interest to claim that the revenues are much lower than they may actually be on natural gas so that he can convince us, oh my goodness, he can really turn the screws on us. Thank you. Uh, let me give it to Yaroslav first. Yes, if you allow me, a very short answer uh, on, uh, on gas price, and thank you very much. Uh, that's actually a very important and interesting point, uh, because Lithuania is a country which, according to Eurostat, pays uh, the highest price for, for gas, being almost the closest to the source. It is very important, and let me assure you that actually this situation is the biggest motivator for us to do the, the reform in gas sector. That's exactly why we are doing this, to get the price down. And Alan, right. last okay. comment, unless... Uh, yeah, well, I, just, I, just, I just want to do a couple of things. On shale gas, um, I think the point about it is that there is this danger that uh, essentially you develop all the shale gas, uh, coal has got nowhere to go, it's dumped into the markets. And there are ways of dealing with this. I mean, one of them is to simply regu progressively regulate coal out of the system. And I think one of the tremendous advantages of shale gas is that it actually provides a solution to the really most important uh, climate change problem, and that is the use of coal. What I don't think is understood, because we get kind of terribly into all the renewables, and let's stand back and we'll look at what's really happening. Between 1960 and 2000, the world uh, consumption of coal increased by 50 quads of coal. Between 2000 to 2010, increased by a further 50 quads of coal. And we are essentially burning the planet with Chinese, largely the, the use of Chinese, the Chinese use of coal. And it is the Chinese, and to a degree the Indian, vast increase in use of coal, which is, which is the immediate climate change threat. And that is what we have to deal with. Now, the great advantage of shale gas is that it's massively uh, um, spread across the entire world. The Chinese apparently have more technically recoverable shale gas than the United States. So actually encouraging development of that and progressively regulating out coal out of the system, because you can regulate it on lots of grounds, because it is dirty, it, 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 the massive degree of particulates it produces and so forth. You can progressively regulate it out of the system. And I think part of it is actually creating in Europe a transferable system of both of shale gas development, which is an environmentally safe shale gas de de uh, uh, development approach, which can be transplanted to other states, whilst developing a progressive means of regulating out coal out of the system, which also can be trans uh, transplanted <coughs> to other states, is something which could actually positively help. So Europe actually helps the rest of the world mm. develop this pathway, this glide way away from coal, uh, and, and using bringing gas as the bridging fuel, and actually beginning to smooth out and, and slow down the increase in CO2 emissions caused by, by this massive push to wash no, I'm coal sorry, over the last few years. That's, um, Thank you. Uh, yes, one more talk. About well, uh, just on three brief points. First of all, on the question of interconnectors. From the Commission point of view, and I think Matthew pointed out, uh, the Commission very much would like to see this process moving ahead, but it needs a minimum level of cooperation among member states, especially if it's a regional uh, project, and sometimes it doesn't work so smoothly. Let me uh, stop here. My uh, second issue on the OPAL was specifically raised. This is now being looked at and uh, with the intention to maintain competition at, in the use of the OPAL pipeline. And finally, on the issue of uh, cross-subsidization, nobody has a problem if uh, the, uh, by exports the 
Russian <coughs> consumers are, are subsidized, but when the Russian industry is subsidized to get inputs at below market prices, that causes a problem. Uh, <coughs> Russia has quite clear WTO commitments in this area, and as we are watching very thoroughly that it be uh, respected. The organizers are going to uh, give a, a brief announcement in a second about lunch and tours. But before we do, I think I'd like you all to uh, join me in thanking the panel for a terrific presentation.